Good afternoon. Welcome to the tea table. I am so happy you have joined me today. And we are going to go far across the ocean to something that we all are hearing about every day, and that is the Middle East. And we are going to go and have a cup of tea in the Middle East. And it is such a complicated place filled with so many different people and countries. It's vast and its influence is vast in the area of tea. Because you know, if you look at a map, I wish I had a map here, but you look to the extreme west of the Middle East and the south of Eastern Europe, and you will find yourself in Turkey, and you will find yourself in Istanbul, and um, the, the famous waterway there, that the Straits of Derendel that go out of the Mediterranean up into the other seas. And most people have studied various histories of this area, going all the way back to Alexander the Great, and before, in biblical times. Um, the same people are there that were there during the days of Moses. Yes, Egypt was there during the time of Moses. And they've e archaeologists, they've even found Ur of the Chaldees, which is where Abraham came from. So we're talking ancient, unique, colorful, and the influence that I want to talk about today is tea. Because you know, it is very famous to know that in the Middle East, the people are hospitable. The good, basic people love to be hospitable. And the main thing they will offer a foreigner or a stranger is a cup of tea. And I have brought with me today a very, very special set. And I really don't know where it's from because it has no markings, but it has, if you can look closely, I'll pick up one of the cups. It has all the design. It has that ceramic in the copper and the little copper cups. These are very, very little. Sometimes on camera, the pot is very, very little, very little. I will show you, for example, this is my, an average teapot, which probably is four to six cups. Now, this is the difference in size. You can see it's, it's quite a bit of difference. This would be maybe two cups of what we would consider tea. However, because their tea is so strong, they drink it differently than we do. They drink it almost stiff strong in little cups. And I don't see a creamer here because they don't, I don't believe generally put cream in. They will maybe put sugar in. But I have heard it said, people that I know personally that went to visit Bedouin people, were invited into the Bedouin tent and they would sit down on the ground on these rugs, these beautiful Persian rugs that they're so famous for, and they would serve you tea. And that was the way it was. Now that tea worked its way up, as I said, through Turkey and then up into Russia. And that is what I brought to show you today. This is a samovar. This is a real samovar, a real samovar from Russia, more than 150 years old, maybe older. I really don't know. There's no date on it. And this is the little pot, also very small, that they would have the hot water here boiling over the coal. They had coal down at the bottom and hot water. And then the little spigot here would fill up the pot and they'd have the tea here very strong. 
very strong tea. And then for the Russians, now these are some little Russian cups here. I'll try to pick up this uh, samovar setup. The little Russian cups are small too. I put candles in them just for fun, but that is ceramic white on brass. And then you have probably seen in pictures, many of the Russian will serve tea in a glass and it will be a glass perhaps framed in the brass or a metal of some type, silver perhaps, and then maybe an inch of tea and then the rest hot water to their taste. So tea goes up, 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 up into Russia. And do you know when you get way up, Russia is not a country. We talked about that before. Russia is a world. And it's got, I think, six or seven time zones. When you finally get to Siberia, the tip, tip northeast, you can look across and you can see the hills of China. And in some places you can see Alaska. Isn't that amazing? And you know, it's a cold, much of it is cold and barren and the hot tea kept them warm. Now, we always think of the Middle East as being so hot, like a desert. And that's really why I did this uh, talk today. And I will share that in a minute because of a scripture that I read this morning. And I thought, where would be a cup of cold water most appreciated? I think in a desert. And so we think of the Middle East as being hot, but there are many parts of it that are very cold and even get snow in the winter in the mountains. We never think of that. I never think of that. Well, the scarf I'm wearing today is cashmere. And on the label, it says, and it's definitely from the Middle East, my son-in-law brought me a, a scarf very similar to this uh, from Iraq once, uh, Pash, Pashina, 100% cashmere. And so cashmere is that wonderful, wonderful, this is actually wool, you would never know it. And the prints on it I wore because they're elephants. And I just, I know the elephants, we don't, we think of that as Africa, but the elephants are on the scarf and they're part of the design of, and I just love the feeling of the colorfulness of each country that presents their best to one another. Well, also I'm wearing a Turkish necklace, which is very much, I had the most beautiful jewelry my mother-in-law brought me years ago from Israel that she got from the Bedouins. And I thought, what happened to that? I kept looking for this. It was a beautiful woven silver, whatever they use, in a shape of a bell. And I'm a singer, and she always told me, you have a bell in your voice. And I thought it was my special piece. And then she brought me one that had two S's, and that was for my initials, Susan Shoemaker. Well, I couldn't find them. And I thought, how do you lose jewelry that big? Because I very rarely wore it. Well, one day I was visiting my oldest daughter, Victoria, and she was showing me some of her jewelry. Aha, there was my better when jewelry. I had let her use it. So I'm so thankful it's safe and sound She's taking care of it. Someday I'll borrow it back and show you. Anyway, back to why we are going to the Middle East today. Well, I want to say a prayer before we close out our tea talk today for the Middle East and for particularly all of the beautiful people in Afghanistan, all the Americans and all the good people that don't know what's going to happen. So we will pray for that before we leave this. But I wanted to honor the beauty that is there. And you know, when you study any kind of history over the last 200 years, archeology span is what really became so big. The British, the French, and the Germans were the beginning of it. And you know, the, the 
when Napoleon was <laughs> taking target practice at the Sphinx in Egypt, his scientist that was with him, an archeologist, discovered the Rosetta Stone. And that is how we were able to understand hieroglyphics and all the languages of the Middle East, because there are three languages written on the Rosetta Stone. And you can see it today in the British Museum. You can look it up online and see it. I've seen it in person when I was very young and it was the key. It was the key because it had three languages that no one had been able to decipher. But once they had the one language and the other, they could figure it out. And that's why we can now understand Egyptian hieroglyphics. It's a fascinating story, just the study of archeology. span And so many of these wonderful men were Christians. And the more they studied and the more they looked, the, it was confirming all the Bible being true. The biblical history lines up time, place with all their findings. Beautiful. And you know, they found the famous um, Qumran scrolls that gave them old, old, old passages of Isaiah and Jeremiah and, and passages that were almost original to the time proving. And the fascinating thing is, my husband was saying, you know, we have closer proofs of true copies of the Bible from the Old Testament. We have closer proofs to that than we have to Aristotle and Plato and all of the famous Greek writings. The nearest writing we have to them is six or 700 years after and we assume that's true, right? We assume their writings are true and untampered with. We have to take it on faith. Well, they are finding older and older and older writings as they excavate and do archeological digs. I always had a dream of going on an archeological dig to the Middle East. Well, I didn't quite realize that dream, but I can study now and so many videos and wonderful information. And I did get to go to the British Museum and I went to the Egyptian Museum in, in Cairo, which have more artifacts than, than one could ever dream to see. I remember at the Egyptian Museum, I remember seeing petrified bread. And that was bread from the time of the Pharaohs. Incredible. In fact, they don't really know how they, the formula, they don't really know the formula for mummification that the Egyptian used. Isn't that interesting? So the Middle East holds many, many mysteries and many exciting journeys and discoveries. Even Agatha Christie, her husband was an archeologist from Britain. That's why so many of her books are based in Beirut and in, um, you know, Istanbul and, and Lebanon, because she went and accompanied him on those journeys. You can read her biography, quite fascinating. And so her stories really opened up the real world of what the real people lived like um, to a whole world of fans and readers. Well, every morning I try to read my daily light. And I don't know if I've told you about this book, but I treasure it. My translation is The Living Light. It's very old and you can't really, they aren't printing The Living Light. You have to order it, but you can still order it online. It's The Living Bible Translation of The Daily Light. Well, The Daily Light is a little devotional that was created and printed in England over 150 years ago by a minister named Samuel Bagster. And he had seven or eight children and he wanted to make the devotions that he had in his home interesting to the children. And so he would assign each of his children to do research and to do theme studies of the Bible. And by that, I mean, you know, you study like 
different verses on the trees or different verses on love, different verses on hope. And it made it so interesting to his family that they all couldn't wait for their devotions. Well, out of that, someone said, let's just print it into a book. There's so many now. So when I was in Scotland years ago, a little man gave me a daily light and I started reading it. And then I discovered almost all the Christians I knew in England all read the daily light. And even Hudson Taylor, the famous missionary in China, all of those people, you can read his biography and he'll say, God spoke to me today through my daily light. Um, I, it, it's just amazing. So I brought it home. I gave it to my mother. And my mother just loved it. She said, this is opening up the Bible in a wonderful way. And she used to take a lot of time in the morning. You can read it in less than five minutes, your morning reading, maybe three minutes. But she would take and research each verse and go into deeper study with commentaries. And she said, I have just love my daily light. Well, I was reading it this morning, and I highly recommend getting one. You can order them online. And the reading was this. I'm going to read a little bit of it. It says, God is not a man that he should lie. He doesn't change his mind like humans do. God, the creator of all light, shines forever without change or shadow. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. His faithful promises are your armor. God also bound himself with an oath so that those he promised to help would be perfectly sure and never need to wonder whether he might change his plans. He has given us both his promise and his oath, two things you can count on. Now, you know, I must have read a different verse because I was reading this morning without my glasses, and now I can't find it. Uh, that was August 20th, the creator of light. Well, let's finish it out. Happy is the man who has the God of Jacob as his helper whose hope is in the Lord, the God who made both earth and heaven, the seas and everything in them. He is the God who keeps every promise. Whoa, isn't that gorgeous? And you can just take that and then there's an evening reading. But somehow I will tell you, I will be totally honest, the reading I read this morning I must have gotten the wrong date. Like I said, I was reading without my glasses. And it was saying, whoever gives a cup of cold water in the name of the Lord gives it unto me. And that's Jesus's words. In other words, you give a cup of cold water to someone and you're giving it to Jesus. You're giving it to him. Now I started thinking about the desert and the cold water and then I thought, well, you know what? If we give a cup of tea to someone and we bring them cheer and we bring them hope and we bring them God's love and we converse with them, we are giving that to him. And he is pleased with that. God has created us as human beings to communicate. What is a tea party? A tea party brings us together. It lets us be together and share. You know, the last thing Jesus did on earth before he died was have communion and a meal with his disciples. Isn't that interesting? Now I just remembered we haven't poured out. If you haven't gotten your tea, please pause the video and get it. And I'll be waiting for you. This is a little tiny cup. This is so little. And I'm going to do it authentic, no milk. I'm going to taste it now.
very good. Now they're copper lined. I'm just kind of holding my breath, hoping I'm not going to get poisoned with the metal, but I think it's all right. Mm. It's very good. You know, plain tea is very good. Very good. Indeed. Well, I thought, what kind of food would we serve for the feel? I thought, Fiofels. Now, this is my little version of Fiofels. It's very different than probably theirs, but it's a little green, a spinach, um, you know, round flowered like tortilla. And then I just stuffed it with a little bit of egg and cheese. And that's my fiofel for today. And then I thought we have to have flowers at our tea table. Let's put them out. These are my roses. This rose finally, whoa, this rose finally bloomed. This is a purple rose. Mm, it's very faint, but a very sweet, very faint smell. My daughter gave me that rose years ago and it just only blooms certain times when it wants to. These are my faithful little tea roses that keep blooming, blooming, blooming. And I just think this color combination looks like the Middle East. Let's just put it right up here where we can really enjoy it and see it. I love my flowers. Now for a little sweeter treat, because I know in the Middle East they like that. I have some fig cookies. They have a lot of figs there. And then I have a little, just a little scorpa that's left that seems kind of like a biscotti. That's a little north of the Middle East, but you know, all of these cookies and treats, fiofels, like in Greece, you're getting gyros with the lamb and then you go down to the Middle East, it's almost the same. They all blend in together because in that Mediterranean area, they have the most fabulous fruits, vegetables, everything grows. It is like the Garden of Eden, you know. Um, I remember being in Greece years ago and seeing the dates and the figs at the public market, fruit and, um, oh my goodness, with that sunshine and that wonderful sea air, you've got fabulous things. And the Middle East is the same. I've never seen oranges as big as I saw in Egypt and Israel. Well, you know, so when we think about this and, and we think about a cup of cold water or a cup of tea to give a friend, you know, I think about my dad. He was from Norway and he came as a 10 year old boy on the boat with his brother Goodmund and his sister Ruth and his parents and came to Tacoma and lived. But when he was a young man, and you know, Norwegians are like coffee is their, practically their religion. Well, he was told by a doctor that he perhaps had a heart murmur and he should not drink coffee. So he, the doctor said, you may drink tea. So my father was very obedient and he only drank tea his entire life. And do you know? When he passed on at the age of 80, it's very interesting because the young middle-aged doctor who cared for him said, your father has the heart of a 40 year old. He has a perfect heart. That isn't what he passed from. Isn't that amazing? But my main point I wanna make is my father, he was very quiet, very soft-spoken, gentle and but when he spoke, you remembered what he said. I remember everything he said. He said a, a good cup of tea and a good bun sitting and conversing will solve almost any problem. Isn't that good? Take that to the bank. That's where the problems need to be solved, at the table conversation, in the family, with the friends. Relax a little and don't hold everything so tight. Let a little bit go and enjoy yourself. That's my highest recommendation. Well, 
Another reason this talk came was because I, well, I'm wearing my lion earrings again for you. I hope it's all right. I wear them twice, but I have something special that's called tiger, tiger eye. And I have a ring and a pendant. And I thought these really go, I don't know, with Middle East. I know Middle East has, this was a ring that my son actually gave me from Iraq that he bought from the Bedouins. And it's a little silver ring. I can hardly get through all these teapots, but there it is. And it's a sweet little filigree silver with a turquoise. But um, I, I think the tiger's eye too, I don't know where it comes from, but it reminded me of, I don't know, Middle East, East Africa, China. I don't know where it comes from. I have to study it. But you know, I just believe that we, we are living in very different times. But do you know, my main point is God hasn't changed. He's still there. He created you and I to be here in the world at this time, in this place. And he wants us to have love, peace, and joy, kindness, goodness, mercy, and grace. And so we do not need to be upset by the world situation. What we can do is take it to God in prayer and do our best to be kind to others, to encourage others to trust God and to pray that the leaders of the world will have wisdom. You know, and then we can retain our peace and peace is a beautiful characteristic. Shalom, shalom. The word shalom, if you print it on your computer and ask for the Hebrew definition for shalom, it will print out three pages. It is so big. And that's when Jesus said, when he left, he goes, my peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth. I give you my peace, shalom. It means goodness. It means kindness. It means enough. It means provision. It means protection. It means grace. There, it just goes on and on and on. It's an expansive word. I encourage you to look it up. And there were very difficult times when Jesus left them. It was a very hard time. Under Roman occupation, he had been crucified. Many of those followers of his were martyrs and gave their lives. But he said, my peace I give unto you. My love I give unto you. And there's a famous saying that came from the first century. And there's a song we used to sing. They'll know we are Christians by our love, one for another. That is why the early church grew, because they saw the early Christians in all the suffering, in all the hardship, loving each other, taking care of each other, there was no welfare. There was no social security. You either had money or you didn't. You were either a peasant or a pauper. You could become a beggar overnight. And there, was, there were not grocery stores or food cards for people that are in bad places. They had to look to God and the church and the love. They took care of each other. And that's what made the church grow. Because people saw that. That was real. That wasn't some fake religion. That was the real thing. And that's what we have. Okay, so I want to close in a prayer with all of you. Join me and um, we'll ask God to help us and to help everyone going through all that is happening. So dear Lord Jesus, we humble ourselves before you, the great and mighty God, King of the universe, the royal King that rules in our hearts and will rule forever and ever. And Lord, I humbly ask that you would bless each 
of this tea time family. Each one is so precious to you. And each one has a special calling in their lives. They have gifts and talents that you want them to use for your glory and to bless others. I pray a blessing on each one that whatever they are supposed to do, that they would have enlightenment, wisdom, understanding, perseverance, and anointing, and spiritual strength to do the good that you want them to do, to give a cup of cold water in your name. Lord, we pray for all of the people in the Middle East today. We lift them up. We ask for mercy. We ask for wisdom. We ask for safety. We ask for protection. We ask for all of the Americans and the different foreign people that have been trapped. We ask that you would send help to get them free and safely out. We ask for the all of the people in the, the nationals, the locals, the people that live there, the good people that really, there are many people there that love you so much and they only want good. Please help them, God. Please make a way where there is no way. Please have mercy upon us. Please have mercy upon us. We ask for wisdom for the leaders of our country and for the leaders of the world. We ask for your goodness, your grace, and your love to be shed abroad in our hearts one to another and Lord, we close, we know that tough times don't last, but tough people do. Help us to be strong. Amen. Well, this has been so special to be with you today. And you know, that's what my pastor Montaigne used to say. Tough times, they don't last. Tough people do. In other words, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might and you will see victory and good. Thank you so much for joining me today. I pray this has been a blessing to you. And please, if you want to join my channel, you can subscribe, ring the bell, and share with anyone you think would be blessed. Thank you so much, and I look forward to seeing you next time.